Hello everyone from beautiful Malta. We continue our exploration of prehistoric megalithic temples, some of the oldest buildings in the world. Today we'll take a closer look at two Neolithic sanctuaries and find out what we actually know about their mysterious builders. I'm taking you to the southern region of Malta, above the steep cliffs of Rendi. We will see some of the oldest, best preserved and picturesque temples in Malta – Ajar Im and Mnaidra. Let's go! From here we have a scenic view of the sea and the rocky islet of Filfla. These ruins are probably the most atmospheric of all the temples in Malta, located on the picturesque cliffs of the southern coast. This beautifully preserved Neolithic temple was probably built around 3600 BC, during the heyday of the so-called Temple period in the Gigantia phase which means that the temple is a thousand years older than the Great Pyramid of Giza. At the time of its creation, the Sumerians of the Uruk period were erecting their first ziggurats. Unlike the temples of Tarshin, Ajarim was never buried under the earth. Although the temples suffered some damage, their basic structure remained a part of the coastal landscape for thousands of years. It's a pity that, due to these huge, overwhelming shelters added here recently, we can't fully enjoy the view. The sky was taken away from the temples and they were left in shadow, which also doesn't make filming easier. Anyway, these temples have always aroused admiration among historians. The 17th century Maltese nobleman and historian Giovanni Francesco Abella, one might say a pioneer of biblical archaeology, wrote in 1647 of the remains of Ajarim. Indubitable evidence of the fact that the first inhabitants of Malta were of the race of giants. In the 19th century, the ruins of Ajarim and nearby Mnaidra were widely considered to be remains of Phoenician or Roman buildings. It was only in the 1920s that it was suggested that the Maltese temples date back to the Neolithic Age. At that time, Ajarim was excavated and restored by the discoverer of Tarshin, the famous Maltese archaeologist Themistocles Zamit. We still know very little about the construction chronology of this sanctuary. It was rebuilt many times already in the Neolithic period, and the archaeological finds, mainly pottery, come from various phases of the temple period. Raw monumental and masterfully built Stone Age temples, often made of megalithic stone blocks, still arouse controversy, inclining pseudoscientists and alternative researchers towards often fantastic conclusions, as is the case with ancient sites about which very little is known. So what do we actually know about the builders of Maltese temples? Most historians believe that they arrived on the island from nearby Sicily, around 5500 BC. These people were supposed to bring with them the entire Neolithic package – that's cultivation of crops, domestication of animals and making mud bricks. A thousand years after their arrival, megalithic temples began to be built, so some believe that a new wave of migration occurred at the end of the pre-temple period. 
Most researchers, however, believe that the temple period is a localized development from the preceding culture, as the genetic features and morphology of the discovered skeletons do not differ over thousands of years. When settlers arrived on the island over 7,000 years ago, it looked completely different. We know that it was forested and full of fertile, although not very deep, soil. The current barren landscape of the island is, as is commonly believed, the result of the exploitation of this quite small land. The entire archipelago is only about 300 square kilometers. The deforestation and the overexploitation of soil was to end the temple period around 2500 BC. Malta entered the Bronze Age, already depopulated and deforested. A beautifully carved altar with a plant motif known as the Tree of Life from Ajar Im. The so-called sculpture room or the first chamber, where several beautifully carved artifacts were discovered in the 1930s, including a plate with a spiral motif. It's of course a copy, the original can be seen in the National Archaeological Museum in Valletta. Also the famous images of corpulent women, the so-called Mother Goddess or Maltese Venus, were found in this room. The so-called Southern Temple of Ajarim is not a typical Maltese temple. It must have had special importance, as it was constantly expanded and enlarged. New apses and niches were built using external blocks of the original building. As many as three apses are independently connected to the exterior. There must have been a lot of traffic here. Ornate stone furniture was probably used by priests or the local elite during ceremonies or rallies, as temples also served as political centers for local communities. We are looking now at perfectly preserved table altars. Neolithic temples in Malta were most often built on the southeastern slope, in areas best suited for cultivation, as the sanctuaries were probably accompanied by numerous houses. Over time, other temples were added to the main one, also oriented to the east or southeast. Ajarim is unique because it was built on the top of a hill, so the structures added to it spread evenly around it. However, it was built according to the same plan as all other temples. The builders of the megalithic temples of Malta aimed for a particularly specific result. The temples had to face the sun's most southerly position at sunrise, that's the winter solstice, when the sun casts its longest shadow. Perhaps during the construction of the temple, a pole was placed in the doorway as a marker to help locate the main passage, often ending with an altar, which in the dark-roofed temple was illuminated by a beam of light during the winter solstice. It must have been impressive. So the temples also served as giant solar calendars. We'll get back to it later. Unfortunately, we know little about the builders of Malta's great temples. They lived in small characteristic oval mud brick huts or caves. This wasn't due to cultural backwardness. Numerous Maltese caves served as houses in Malta even in the 19th century. So it seems that they devoted all their effort and architectural skills only to religious monuments.
In the outer wall, just behind the right corner of the facade, we can see the largest block of this temple. This block weighs almost 20 tons, is more than 6 meters long and almost 3 meters high. It's amazing! The temples were built of honey-colored Globigerina limestone, characteristic of Malta. In fact, 70% of the Maltese archipelago is composed of Globigerina limestone. Over thousands of years, the temple has undergone intense weathering. This is especially visible on the southern outer wall, exposed to sea winds. The climate of Malta is not favorable to ancient monuments. This large cover over the temple, erected several years ago, protects it against gusty winds, scorching sun and rain. Heavy showers are common in Malta. Of course, it rained during my visit, which I was completely unprepared for. If it weren't for this tent-like shelter, I would be in trouble. There are no buildings here, the temples are located in the middle of nowhere. What? The area around the temples is still uninhabited, a pristine rocky landscape as far as the eye can see, and to the south the blue of the Mediterranean Sea. A picturesque view until 2009, of course, when this protective shelter was erected. Interestingly, archaeologists haven't found any weapons or defensive structures from Neolithic times. This confirms the theory about peaceful egalitarian societies that, instead of showing hostility, engaged in friendly interactions. In art, instead of images of warriors, Images of corpulent figures, mostly female, dominated. The idea of an idyllic community of temple builders is supported by the analysis of bones found in Maltese tombs. Recently I took you inside such burial structures, link in the description. They appear to have been very healthy and well fed. Interestingly, no traces of a fish diet were found among the inhabitants until the Tarshin phase, the end of the Neolithic period, when there might have been a shortage of food on the island, which, after all, had been exploited for 3000 years. We don't know for sure why the culture of temple builders came to an end at the turn of the 3rd and 2nd millennium BC. Soil erosion making cultivation impossible. This is the most likely scenario. Researchers also mention natural disasters, epidemics and invasions of other peoples. Some even suggest collective suicide. Around 2500 BC a people familiar with metallurgy, a people of warriors came to Malta, probably from Sicily. The newcomers didn't build temples, but dolmens and defensive walls, and cremated their dead. They were probably one of the ancestors of the current Maltese people. The much smaller and older North Temple is, as you can see, in poor condition. Together with an even smaller and even older so-called Primitive Temple from around 3700 BC, as well as with the main temple, it constitutes the Ajar Im complex. The tiny rocky island of Filfla was probably considered sacred by temple builders. A Neolithic shrine and pottery were found there, probably left as votive offerings. One of the chambers of the Ajarim temple faces the island. Also, the oldest of the three temples of Menaidra is oriented towards Filfla. A 
ahead of us a short walk to the second temple complex, less than 500 meters away from Ajar Im. The Minaidra complex consists also of three temples, the smallest, so-called primitive temple, the Minaidra north and the Minaidra south, also called lower temple. The megalithic facade has a trilithon entrance. The central passageway leads to the apses with their niches, a typical Maltese temple. The walls of Nidra, located 500 meters closer to the sea than Ajarim, although also exposed for thousands of years, show less damage. This is because a harder coralline limestone was used to build them. Nidra is famous for its astronomical features. It appears to have been intentionally constructed to face celestial bodies, especially the equinox sent sunrises at the summer and winter solstices. We can see the altar, which was illuminated at sunrise during the equinox. The originally roofed southern temple must have been dark, but its interior was illuminated by the rising sun during the summer and winter solstices and at the equinox. These mornings must have been awaited by priests and believers. I bet that at this time important rituals were performed. The first rays of the rising sun during the summer solstice illuminate the orthostat standing in the left front apse. The rising winter solstice sun illuminates the orthostat standing in the right apse. An orthostat is a stone, freestanding slab placed vertically as an element of a, a larger Neolithic structure. Sunrises during the winter solstice were also supposed to be framed by the so-called oracle holes, windows cut in stones. There is no doubt about the advancement of Maltese Stone Age astronomers. In the 1920s, Temizamit found in the ruins of the Taladi temple in the north of the country the so-called Sky Tablet of Taladi, a prehistoric star map made of limestone dated to the Tarshin phase. According to some, this temple was intended to serve as an observatory and a calendar to mark heliacal star rises. Interestingly, in the astronomical calendar of Nidra, some researchers see the influence of the builders of the oldest astronomical site known to us, the so-called calendar circle in the Egyptian Napta Playa. It's a stone circle discovered in the Nubian desert, about 100 kilometers west of Abu Simbel, dating back about 7,000 years. These are the times when Napta Playa was still a savanna. Did the astronomical knowledge of the builders of Mnaidra come from Africa? We are now in Menaidra North, or the Central Temple, which was built on a simple plan with four large apses. It's generally believed that the Northern Temple is slightly younger. Located on a higher level, its foundations are based on the northern outer wall of the Southern Temple. It's also more homogeneous. It appears to have been built according to a specific plan and never modified hence it was considered to belong to the late Tarshin phase. Originally, temples with stone roofs were at least twice as high as they are today. We see the remains of corbelling in one of the three apses of the central temple. The span of the apse significantly decreases with each row of stones.
a rare relief depicting a temple in which we clearly see the blocks of the domed roof, and this image is consistent with other preserved representations of temples. What shocked me when looking for information about this temple? It turned out that in 2001, Manaidra fell victim to unimaginable vandalism. It happened in the morning, on Friday, April 13th, under a full moon. A guard leading the students on a night tour of the temple came across the destruction. About 60 megaliths were dropped, some of them cracked. The group of perpetrators used crowbars, and perhaps even machinery. Symbols were also carved on fallen stones. The temples were rebuilt, using new techniques and reopened to visitors in 2018. However, people responsible for the attack were never found. Despite such terrible incidents in the past, ancient places in Malta are extremely friendly to tourists. The temples are beautiful, just like Randy itself. But it's time to return to my hotel in the north of the country. I hope I won't get lost. And now I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons. Thank you so much, you are simply beyond. And if you're new here, I recommend you to watch my videos from Egypt, Turkey, Greece and Italy. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel to be up to date with new episodes. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to my channel, like and share this video with your friends. I'd like to thank all my patrons. Thank you for your support. And see you on another ancient site.